Welcome to XPISCOR, the weblog of Stephen Hall, Director General of the World Fish Center. In these blogs, Steve gives his personal reflections on current topics and areas of debate in the realm of fish and development. In this podcast of his blog, Steve talks about the fish meal question, fish for food versus fish for feed. There's something circular about the idea of catching fish to use as feed for farmed fish, livestock, poultry and our pets. And with about one third of the global fish catch going in this direction, most of it destined for aquaculture, you might well ask whether growing the farmed fish to put in your supermarket has deprived a hungry or malnourished person of food. Well, for that to be true, we'd have to show that fish used for animal feeds would be both an available and affordable food for direct consumption by the poor. For at least part, around 6% of the world's fish catch used for animal feed, that's not true. There are some fish that are simply not nice to eat. No one so far, for example, has overcome the technical barriers to economically process sand eel caught in northern Europe or menhaden in the USA into an acceptable food form for humans. That's not to say that it might not happen, but it hasn't happened yet. But then there are the fish destined for animal feed that we can eat. These comprise about 64% of the global supply of fish for the fish meal and oil used in feeds. And in principle, at least, these fish represent an affordable food source. If you look at the price animal feed producers pay for the fish they use, it's low compared to the price even poor consumers pay for their fish. And in some places, many of these fish are indeed consumed directly. Recent studies in Africa, for example, show that marine pelagic fish species caught on the continent that elsewhere go to produce fish meal and fish oil contribute about 46% of total food fish calories and 43% of protein supply. So why is the rest of the global catch of these fish, the vast majority, reduced to fish meal and fish oil rather than eaten directly? Well, most of the answer lies in the distance between where the fish are landed and suitable markets. Where that distance is large, as it is in most cases, market forces and consumer preferences weaken the economic rationale for diverting fish destined for fish meal into direct human food. Put simply, the required storage and transport costs that are passed on to consumers currently puts the price beyond their willingness and ability to pay. There are some cases, though, where high storage and distribution costs can't explain the diversion to fish meal. Politically powerful fish meal producers might, for example, use their influence to secure access to the catch to continue making fish meal despite a ready market for fish in local markets that would meet poor consumer needs. That's a situation that appears to occur in several African states. And these and other market distortions that deny access to affordable fish for the poor need policy interventions to fix. Several countries, for example, support domestic food supply by prohibiting the use of food-grade fish for animal feeds. Even Peru, whose anchoveta fishery provides about 6 million metric tonnes per year for the fish meal and fish oil industry, requires several other species to be used solely for direct consumption. But even when a local market for direct purchase does exist, it's still sometimes of greater benefit to the poor if these fish are diverted into fish meal. In areas where this fish meal helps support a large shrimp or finfish aquaculture sector, for example, the benefits of the local employment and other economic opportunities for the poor can outweigh the benefits of the additional fish supply. But in poor regions where there are no such industries, analysis suggests that diverting the catch into food markets can substantially increase supplies of affordable fish, employment and other economic opportunities for the poor and improve overall well-being. A final category of fish destined for animal feeds are the juveniles of the target species, or other species caught inadvertently, the so-called trash fish. Here again, evidence does suggest that in some coastal areas of developing countries, especially in Asia, diverting these fish to aquaculture feeds is reducing access of the poor to cheap fish in the local markets of the region where the bycatch is landed. 
but using bycatch could be complicated. Although there may be potential to increase in food nutrition security in some regions by diverting it directly to local consumer markets, we have to balance this against the fisheries management imperative to reduce the bycatch of juveniles of commercially harvested species or those that are endangered. And for that reason, public policy should probably often favour bycatch reduction rather than a diversion into either aquaculture feeds or direct human consumption. Still, for the bycatch that is landed, establishing policies that favour direct use by humans over diversion to aquaculture could yet yield substantial benefits for the poor. So, looking at the whole picture, does using fish to feed fish deprive the poor of food? Well, in some circumstances the answer is clearly yes. But from an overall global perspective, no. On the contrary, a recent global estimate suggests that including fish meal and fish oil in feeds for aquaculture products actually increases the overall global supply of fish for human consumption by about 7 to 8 million tonnes a year. Admittedly, much of that fish comprises salmon and shrimp that are beyond the purchasing powers of poor consumers, but that's not always the case. In Egypt, for example, the local aquaculture industry produces fish at market prices that are lower than red meat or poultry. And in many other countries, commercially produced fish feeds to grow lower value fish are used to supply local consumers. And as I said before, one must also bear in mind that the aquaculture and fish meal industry can often provide greater economic benefit to the poor than direct consumption because of the jobs and the multiplier effects that increased trade and economic activity from the industry bring. And if you need further comfort, it's worth noting that since 2004, fish meal and fish oil use has remained static while aquaculture has continued to grow. This trend's occurred because new feeds have proportionally more soya and other plant source proteins in them, and more plant-eating fish and shellfish species are being farmed. And this decoupling of aquaculture growth from wild fish supply is comforting because Efforts to increase catches to supply animal feeds could compromise the sustainability of these fisheries. In fact, recent modelling studies are showing just how important the fisheries that supply animal feeds are for also sustaining populations of larger predators. So, further efforts to limit or perhaps even reduce catches might be needed to ensure that they continue to do this. So, with little prospect that fish meal and fish oil supplies can be increased, the limits to supply and price pressures will continue to drive efforts to further improve feed use efficiency and substitution, both with crop-based alternatives and more innovative substitutes from algae and other sources. We're also seeing feed producers make better use of aquaculture co-products, the parts of the fish that have some value but are often underutilised, and fish by-products, the parts which can't currently be used. About 25% of fish meal is now produced from these sources. And further research investments to process these products and address value chain disconnects and legislation barriers to using animal byproducts in feeds could provide not just further substantial quantities of fish meal and fish oil, but also a range of human foods, fish sources, pastas and mousses. So when you're next at the supermarket wondering about the farmed fish in front of you, take some comfort. It's unlikely to have deprived someone less well-fed than you of a meal. That said, there's no room for complacency. The fisher will need to further improve management practices to ensure sustainability of fish meal and fish oil supply. The fish farmer will need to become more efficient. The researcher will need to find feed substitutes and the policy analysts will need to continually ask whether incentives are aligned to ensure that we make the most of what nature provides. Unless these steps are taken, we will not meet the world's growing need and demand for fish and sustain the systems that supply them. Thank you for listening to the podcast for Expiscor, the web blog of Stephen Hall. If you've got any comments or feedback for Steve on this podcast, go to www.worldfishcenter.org and post them to the blog, or email expiscor at worldfishcenter.org. 
Also, be sure to find us on iTunes and subscribe.